Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Welcome to First United Methodist Church out on the prairie. It's good to see you all, friends. Let's stand and sing together as we begin this morning. And I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. And I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. I want just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toils and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. I want just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea to be daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is old, time for me will be no more. So guide me gently, safely, oh, to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Credit Jesus is my plea to be daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Man, let's pray together, friends. God, thank you for each each person that's come here today. All over the map, some coming in really raw, <clears throat> some coming in really happy, some coming in somewhere in the middle, some coming in with heavy hearts. God, we ask that you would meet each of us where we're at, that we would um, meet each other where we're at. We would laugh with those who are laughing and weep with those who are weeping and just enjoy life together, the ups and downs, ins and outs. And I pray that each soul here would know that they matter. Each heart would know that they matter. Each story would know that it's important for the human journey. Help us to listen to one another today, to look each other in the eye, to be here for one another. And in so doing, we'll find you. We always do. We ask all this in Christ's name and all of God's kids agreed and said, amen. Amen. Well, let's take a minute to do that. Run around the room. You don't have to make it quick. You can actually give someone a hug, shake a hand and say, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Right, kiddos, it is time for Sunday school. Sister Ida is back there. She's waving at you kids, and you can follow her to Sunday school. 
and uh, parents, uh, she will bring them back as well before communion, just so you know where your kids are and where they're going and when they're coming back. We love you kids. You matter to us. Let's sing over them, church, as they go. Child of joy, our dearest treasure, God's you are from God. You came back to God. We humbly give you live as one who bears Christ's name. Good morning. Good morning, people of God, and welcome to Prairie Campus of First United Methodist Church here in Colorado Springs. I'm Dave Margiata, as many of you know, a member of this church and a retired pastor. Pastor Patty and her husband Roger are away this week visiting their son, Sam, in Chicago, where he lives and works. So we will carry on. I want to just say a very, very special welcome to those of you who are visitors today, as well as those of you who are here every week. We extend a special welcome to all of you who are single, married, divorced, widowed, partner, straight, LGBTQ, black, brown, white, filthy rich, dirt poor, or just doing okay or in desperate need of a prayer right now. You are welcome here. You can belong here. Many of you know that Pastor Patty likes to take people out for coffee. She's not here this week, but if you would like to do that over at the welcome table, you can have them make a note and she'll contact you. And over there, there's also a gift for you. So we welcome each and every one of you here this morning. Now, our Sunday liturgist today took ill this week, so she's not going to be able to be with us this morning. Hopefully, we'll hear her share at another time. So, right now, I invite you to settle in, center down, and open up your hearts as we enter into the prayers of the people. After I say, Lord, in your mercy, your response is, hear our prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, creator of all things, we see your glorious handiwork all around us. Help us now to pause and ponder your generosity and setting us on this earth to enjoy, to tend, to cherish your gift of creation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Creator God, you made us also not to be strangers to you, but to enjoy the most intimate fellowship with you, to live as your beloved daughters and sons. Remind us in these moments how dearly you hold each one of us. Lord, in your mercy. We desire, O oh God, to be awake to your loving presence to us in Christ, to recognize in the face of Christ your desire to bring all the peoples of the earth into your kingdom, to have us hear your invitation to take our place at your table. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who suffer anywhere, for any reason. May those who respond to their needs be effective and compassionate in their service. Stir our hearts to be those people who respond and serve. Lord, in your mercy. And now please join me in the prayer of confession as printed on the slide. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors 
and we have not heard the cry of the needy. We have done things we should not have done, and we have neglected to those things we should have done. Forgive us and turn us around, we pray. Lord, in your mercy. And now we pray in the silence of our hearts for those persons and concerns that are particularly dear to us. Lord, in your mercy. And now let us pray together the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you came in this morning, you were offered a bulletin, mostly full of announcements. And I invite you to look this over carefully. Most of what's in here is also communicated through our weekly uh, email. It's an e-newsletter, I guess, and that also has a ton of information about all the many things going on here. Just a very brief reminder that next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, which means it's Food Sunday, right, which is Potluck Sunday as well as an opportunity to bring in uh, goods for supplying local food pantries. So that's a way that we celebrate uh, God's good gift of food. Speaking of that, for the youth, grades 6 through 12th grade, today is also Donuts Day, all right? another gift of God to the human race, right? They're going to meet from 11 to 11.45 down and around the hall there. It is a time of uh, connection and uh, growing in faith. So we invite all the youth to stop in and enjoy the donuts. Those of you who are now out of the 12th grade, I want to extend an invitation to you to join uh, post-12th graders in our uh, Sunday morning class, which goes from 9 to 9.45, it, we are studying a book by the Reverend Adam Hamilton, uh, Unafraid, and it is a wonderful uh, exploration of journeying through anxiety uh, by faith. So, invite you to come uh, check that out. It's my... Uh, privilege at this moment now to introduce our guest preacher who will be speaking to us in just a little bit, the Reverend Kathy Eskew, who is uh, happily married to Bruce, who is a CPA, and they have raised three kids who uh, returned to Colorado Springs after being away 10 years, each of them, and uh, they also have four terrific grandkids. Now, this is a fun fact I didn't know, but Kathy was a math major. And those of us who know her might be a little surprised, but um, she pursued her call in life uh, to ministry. She landed in an MA uh, program in youth ministry and a Master of Divinity program in theology from Fuller Seminary out in California. Most of her training, though, is from the School of Hard Knocks, including a year in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Five years with Compassion International and 40 years serving Covenant Presbyterian Church here in the Springs in numerous capacities, including as Associate Pastor of Prayer and Healing Ministry. She's been active here at Prairie Campus in our 
adult formation group, and we're very pleased to uh, have Reverend Kathy bringing us the word this morning. Thank you. So now I invite you to stand as we continuing as we continue to worship in song. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Good morning. I don't know how I could be as old as that list of things I've done, but because I still feel about 30, you know, and those of you who are older than 30 know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, it's been a while since I've had a chance to be here. I've been, it's summer, of course, and as, as it always goes, we're traveling a lot, and I have been here, there, and everywhere, but it's good to be in front of you, and we all miss Patty, and uh, I know she's having a great time, and that's what counts. So, um, I wanted to begin with a question, and the question is fairly simple. The question is, what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? Now, we live in a um, country that is, has, is full of resources. So when I say, what are you hungry for? A lot of us may say, well, I'm tired of pizza, don't want tacos, how about uh, a baked potato and a steak, you know? So it's a tricky question to ask. And I think we all know and have learned over the course of our lives that there are all kinds of hunger, right? I'm involved with an organization that helps Russian orphans cope and thrive after they've been aged out of the orphanage in Russia. So at the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, they are sent to tech schools in older, I'm sorry, in bigger cities 
where they have to learn how to manage their own lives for their very first time. So they come into the cities without knowing how the bus system works. They don't know how to use, how to manage money, how to cook for themselves and shop for food without filling it up full of junk food. They don't know how to find a job. They don't know how to keep a job. They don't know what it means to be a supportive, helpful parent so that when they begin to have children, they begin to turn the cycle over and over and over again. So they're on their own without any family or support system. And you can believe that they are hungry. They are definitely hungry. They're soul hungry as much as just, you know, they're teenagers. They want everything they can eat as, that they can see. But they're hungry for connection. They are desperate for knowledge. They're eager to experience life outside of the orphanage. They're starving for trust and they're famished for hope. And when we're over there and we meet them just as they are, they come terrified, just terrified. But the, it's all disguised under this, I'm okay, I'm doing well, I don't need anybody. Our passage this morning is a very familiar passage to you. It's about Jesus feeding the 5,000 with just loaves and fishes, five loaves and two fishes. I think you know it well. But I would like for us to use this passage this morning as a way of opening us to a, a discussion about soul hunger. What it really means to be hungry. And how God's heart meets that hunger. Psalm 145 says, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. So when God is present, we can expect things to be different. So let's take a look at John 6. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a multitude followed him because they saw the signs which he did on those who were diseased. Jesus went up on the mountain and there sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a multitude was coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, How are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? This he said to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, well, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, well, make the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in a number about 5,000. And Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks... He distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves. So you know this passage, but imagine what it might be to be part of the crowd looking for Jesus. I picture it not as one big mob, amoeba mob, coming up the hill together. I picture them coming up like ants from all different kinds of directions. Looking for Jesus, looking for those, that small group of disciples on a hill, and we know he's there, and let's go find him. So why? Why were they coming? What got them off the proverbial couch? And the author John gives us a clue. He says that they had heard and witnessed Jesus' healings. 
Some may have come for their own healing, their own physical healing, but I would gather that not all of them were there for that reason. If I use my creative imagination, I think that they smelled something different in the air when they heard about Jesus. I think they smelled something authentic because they had been breathing in air that says nothing will ever change in your lives and this is just the way it is. Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. Nothing's ever going to change. The situation I'm in is always going to be the same. And they had breathed that in and out. It had been 300 years since they had heard from a prophet. 300 years. How many generations is that? So they hear about this Jesus and they think, well, maybe God is on the move again. Maybe this Jesus guy who's doing all these healings has something more than just healings. And they begin to smell hope. Maybe someone or something in this present situation could change their oppressive lives. They were oppressed by the Romans, by poverty, by their own kind of hopelessness. Maybe it just might change their personal lives, their health, maybe some relationships, politics. Now imagine what it would be like to be Jesus, sitting on a hill, teaching your, your disciples in a very calm manner, and you see this, this 5,000 mob of, of ants climbing up the hill towards you. And you're who they were looking for. They're hungry. They're expectant. As I thought about this, I thought, I think I would just run. I think I'd get up and just run over the hill. That's what I would do. But if you've ever been a mom with soccer kids or some other kind of uh, drama club coming into your house, hungry and wanting to eat, it's like that times a million. These people are hungry in all sorts of ways. So Jesus sees the crowd and delays his teaching to engage and feed them, just like it's hospitable to do in that day and age. He feeds their body and then he gives them a taste of a miraculous abundance. And I wonder how that felt to that crowd who had their bellies filled. But more than that, they had been seen and acknowledged and respected and taken care of. And Jesus had provided a lunch that not that was just good enough, but one that was abundant, one that was overflowing, not just here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Sit down and maybe you'll have something better later. So what is soul hunger? Let's just talk about that for a second. It's a great question. And there are probably a lot of different answers, and I'd like to just present us one. Soul hunger is a longing to fill up what is lacking in our lives. And it can be very painful. Hunger is painful. And like the orphans in Russia, it can come disguised and masked. Sometimes you know just exactly what you're hungry for. I can't tell you how many times I've just sat at home and said, I just want a little peace and quiet. You know, I know exactly what I'm hungry for, peace and quiet. And then there comes other times when it's not quite so clear and I'm hungry for something, don't know what it is, but it comes out like this in my mind. Well, if I could just lose that five pounds, I'll be a little bit more attractive and fit in my clothes, and then I won't have to buy any clothes. Or we might say, if I just had a relationship, then I'd really feel loved. I'd have love in my life 24-7. Or maybe it's, um, I wish I had a new job, or I wish I had a promotion. Then I would have more executive power. I could decide things, and things could be set straight, and off we go. And I just want to say that hungers are legitimate. I mean, all these hungers that we feel, they are legitimate. We, we want to belong. 
We want to be significant. We want to have a purpose. We want to have power. We want healing. All these things are legitimate. We do not have to apologize for that. And when our souls run on empty like this, we will often fill up on anything, almost anything. I like to liken us to a vacuum cleaner. We are like a vacuum cleaner that indiscriminately sucks up anything in our path to fill up that painful hunger that we feel. Now, I did a little bit of web search. What kinds of things have you literally sucked up in your vacuum while you're, car while you're vacuuming the floor? Just think about it for a second. I guarantee you the most frustrating one for me is when I run over the screw that, that goes to my vacuum cleaner that makes it work. Because then I have to unplug the whole thing and start all over again, and it's just annoying. But I'm very good at picking up paper clips. Maybe some of you have picked up a Lego or two, um, or maybe some coins in the couch. I read online, and I don't know, you tell me if you believe this, but they said they actually sucked up a parakeet. Now, you can put anything on the web, so I don't know whether to think that was true, but they said they were vacuuming up dirty socks, which I can imagine, and they ended up sucking up a parakeet. But the parakeet apparently is fine, so we can relax over that, but I don't know whether I'm going with that one. But anyway, these vacuum cleaners, they're tricky. The point is that our soul pain is really hard to fill. And we will fill up on anything in our path. That's my experience with myself anyway. Going to the refrigerator to, to numb the pain doesn't work. Going to the gym to get rid of the, what you went to the refrigerator for doesn't work. Neither does starting a relationship or making more money. In World War II, the German used the word ersatz. I'd be... I'm, kudos to you if you've ever heard of that. This was a new word for me when I first heard it. Ersatz. Just, I'm not going to call you out, but has anybody heard of the word ersatz? Okay, there you go. Ersatz. It means an artificial or inferior substitute or imitation. So, here you go. Here's a few examples. So, ersatz chocolate. Ugh. <laughs> can be made from carob beans, right? No, it's, that's not chocolate. Ersatz coffee in World War II was made out of acorns. So there you go. That was new to me. When I taste sugar-free vanilla yogurt, it's very saccharine, if that's a word. And it's not the real thing. And it's very ersatz. These dear Russian teenagers, when they get out of the orphanage and they have a, a government stipend that they can go spend on whatever they want, you can imagine what they go do. If you're hungry for connection, if you're hungry for a social life, if you're hungry for friends, where do you turn? Cell phones, right? So, ersatz communication, ersatz connection can be seen in cell phones. And what I'm saying, and I think you can kind of finish up where I'm going with this, that our soul vacuums that are hungry suck up ersatz soul food. And it looks like really good stuff, actually, you know. Ersatz chocolate looks like chocolate. Sugar-free vanilla yogurt looks like vanilla yogurt. If we stay busy enough, then we don't have to face the hunger. If we had more adventures, then we'd be more interesting to others. If we just had that one relationship, then we would feel validated as a person. And again, I want to say none of these things are bad in and of themselves. Being busy, there's nothing wrong with being busy. There's nothing wrong with having adventures. I always look for another adventure. Being in relationship is not wrong. Oh my gosh, it's a beautiful thing. But we just get it backwards. That's our problem. We just 
get it backwards. We're trying to draw life from things that are out there and suck them in to give us life. When actuality, Christ's love and life live in here, we draw from this life and then we have an outpouring of love for others. We have power to love. We have energy to care. We have energy to serve. It's like an air mattress, I've decided. Vacuum cleaner, air mattresses, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. But do you guys have one of those air mattresses that comes with its own pump and you turn it on and you can go, you can just turn it one way or the other and it'll suck in air or it'll push out air? We just need to make sure our valve is going the right way. It's just that simple that we're sucking in all this stuff and it's not meant to feed our souls. And what we need to be doing is turn that valve, bring the light that's within us and let it pour out into our lives and into this very hurting world. Now, how do we get there? Where's this valve? Well, I've known the, the Lord for a long time, and I'm still doing what I'm going to suggest that you do. Because our lives are full of dents and dings and disasters, and as soon as I get my life going one way, something happens, and it all leaks out, right? So we have to keep coming back to that life. I want to read you Ephesians 3, if I may. This is Paul's prayer to the Ephesians, and it's one of my favorite things because it marks where I am probably 75% of the time, and I'll tell you where I am when we get there. For this reason, says Paul, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, see, there, it's his riches, his glory, um, may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit. Okay, this is where I get into the action here. Because I lose my heart. I need courage. I, I, uh, this is where I dial in. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. That you, and here's the trick, may be filled. Isn't that what we want? We want to be filled with all the fullness of God. It's God's fullness that lives within. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly. As in feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish far more abundantly than all we can ask or think and to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen so Jesus, so Paul is praying that we would be filled with Christ in our heart through faith and that Christ would, and his spirit, would continue to fill that empty inner being with his spirit and his energy and his love. And then he talks about being rooted and grounded in Christ. Now, I know some of you are doing this regularly. And some of us are doing this um, as best we can. And some of us haven't even heard this before. So somewhere in there, I know you fit, but we are called to be rooted and grounded in love. The love that cannot be measured. Sometimes it floods us like Niagara Falls and we just feel overwhelmed by his love. And sometimes it trickles in like a faucet, not overwhelming us. We don't have to be worried because he is kind and generous. And we learn to set our roots down and draw from this love. Digging to find courage. Where are you having to dig deep today? Is it something in your life where you just have to dig a little deeper than you ever have before? That seems to be a regular occurrence in, in our lives. 
And then digging deep includes enjoying his creation and delighting in it and seeing him in it and conversing with him, which is another way of just saying prayer, praying with him. And in the midst of all that, we find ourselves changed. Not our circumstances. Now, sometimes they'll change. But who we are on the inside. We begin to see things differently. We begin to love with a little less of self involved. And we begin to become a blessing to others. Because we have been blessed. So, I want to ask you the simple question. And it's something that you might need to chew on for a while. But what are you hungry for? What does your soul say it needs? And over this next week, just think about that. And see if you can't uh, come to know yourself a little better and the Lord as well. And all God's people said, Amen. Hello. Thanks, Kathy, for that good word. Wisdom, indeed. Well, ushers, it's time to take our offering. If you would come forward, we're going to pass the plates around. Um, but there's also instructions on how to give on the screen. That's a very simple way to give. And there's also a tiny little wooden house by the back door, or the rear entrance, I guess you could say where you can drop a love offering. Um, we say it every week, thank you for giving. Uh, your contributions keep this place going. They keep the lights on, literally. And they keep this community together. And when you love something, you give to it. So we are so grateful for the sacrifice of giving that each of you have given you. Thanks. <laughs> With no place to call my home, but there's one who holds my hand, the rugged road through barren lands, the way is dark, the road is steep. He's become my eyes to see, the strength to climb, my griefs to bear, the Savior lives inside me there. In your love I find A haven from my unbelief. So take my life and let it be a living prayer, my God, to Thee. In these trials of life I find, Another voice inside my mind. He comforts me and bids me live inside the love the Father gives. In your love, I find relief. A haven from my unbelief. So take my life and let me be a living prayer. My God to Thee. In Your love I find real. Haven from my unbelief. So 
So take my life and let me be a living prayer, my God, to Thee. So take my life and let me be a living prayer, my God, to Thee. In the scripture that Kathy led us into this morning, we find a very large crowd following Jesus and being fed by him. We are part of that same crowd, and we are invited to share in his feeding once again today. And so we remember Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said to his disciples, this is my covenant given for you in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let us join now together in our prayer of thanksgiving as it's presented on the slide. Holy mystery, send your spirit now on us and on these gifts of bread and juice that we may know Christ's presence real and true and be his faithful followers, showing your love for the world. Amen. The table. It is now ready. You won't be released by the ushers. Just come and receive as you are led. If you desire gluten-free communion, it is available at the table on the far side in the black cloth. If you desire prayer today, I will be available as well as Reverend Kathy during our communion time. There are also baskets in the back where you can dispose of your compostable cups after you have received. Now, most importantly, this is not our table. This is God's table. And we are all welcome at that table. Come. Take 
Beloved God, we have been your guest at this table. We have received your good gifts here. Now we go to our homes, to our neighbors, to our work, equipped to put Jesus' words and being into action, to seek justice, to make peace, to preserve the creation, to be God's love in the world. Amen. After the service, if you are able, it would be a great help if you were to return your chair to the racks at the back of the church. This is the church. And church, please rise. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and always. Amen. <laughs>